All right, we've got five o'clock, time to start. So we'll be wrapping up lesson three. Is that really loud? It feels really loud. No? Okay. Let's just be where I am with the speaker. So we'll be wrapping up lesson three, um, which is going through the details of chapter two, and then we'll dig into lesson four and try to get through that tonight, which is actually the interpretation of the dream. And then on Wednesday, we're going to get into chapter five, which is still in chapter two. We're going to be making applications. So the whole, that whole lesson is just how, how can we make applications from this chapter. So before we begin, Tim's going to lead us in a word of prayer. All right, so let's kind of reset the stage quickly for um, where we're at in the chapter. So the, be the chapter began out began with Nebuchadnezzar having a dream, and he was very anxious to know what it meant. So, and, and we talked about why it was very different from just a normal dream. He knew there was something different about it. What was his demand of his wise men? Tell him what the dream was, and then the interpretation. That way he'd know the interpretation was real because they could tell him the dream. What was his wise men's reply? Impossible. Only a God can do that, right? They said no man can do that, only a God can do that. Were they right in that? Absolutely, they were right in that. Um, so what was Nebuchadnezzar's sentence for all the wise men? Yeah, death. As Carl said, so they're, they're all going to be killed. He said their houses are going to be made ash heaps, which would probably imply their families too. It doesn't specifically say that, but he says their houses would be ash heaps. Then what's Daniel's request? Because Arioch, the commander, comes out. And I think, I think last class I was saying Arioch in chapter 1 when I was talking about the chief of eunuchs, and that's actually Ashvanaz, so I was mixing my names up. Arioch is the commander here. But he's coming out to kill everybody. What's Daniel's request of him? Give me time. And it's interesting that he doesn't say, and I'll see if I can interpret it. He commits to interpreting it, right? He says, give me, give me time that I may interpret it. Um, and then what does, what does Daniel do? Yeah, he prays, and he goes, he goes to his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they talk to God about it, and then it's revealed to him in a night vision, right, what the meaning is. Um, and so he goes back to Arioch and says, I have the interpretation. Arioch rushes him back into Nebuchadnezzar, right? So that's kind of where we left it. So that's, that's where we're at. We'll finish up the details of the chapter, and then we're going to get into the meaning of that, uh, the, of the interpretation. So let's look at... Question seven, that's kind of where we left off. I ask you to describe Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Not what it means, but just what, what did he Verse see? 38, he says, you are this head of gold. So it's Nebuchadnezzar. So how do we, why did I put Babylon instead of Nebuchadnezzar up there? I think, I think there's a dual meaning here because it really is referring to Nebuchadnezzar. But why would we consider that to be Babylon? Yes, they were. And th this is the, both of the pages of the timeline. We're looking at this part over here, and that's probably too small for you to read. That's why I said, unless you pull it out. But there were other kings that came after him. But even though, this is kind of a dual meaning, even though it says you are the head of gold, it represents all of Babylon. Because if you look at, at the, um, in verse 39, after you shall arise, what's it say? 
another kingdom. And then after that, another kingdom. So this is kingdoms being talked about, but Nebuchadnezzar represents Babylon. Why would he represent Babylon? He was the greatest king that they had. He was, I mean, he's, he's one of the, in history, he's a great king, all, all the things that he did and accomplished. His name is still known. So he represented all of them, even though there were other kings that came after him. He was, even, even later we'll see when they, um, in, in chapter 6, I believe it is, with Belshazzar, when the queen talks to the king, she says, your father, Nebuchadnezzar. So even though that wasn't his literal father, he is like the father of the country, kind of like we would look at George Washington. He represents the United States. Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest king, and he represented Babylon. Yeah. Yeah, there's a greatness there. Um, for, absolutely, because he says, you are the head of gold. Here's a map. I don't know how well that shows back there, but the kind of green area is Babylon. This is not the greatest map, but I had trouble finding ones that I really like. So, and I spend a lot of time making slides. I spend more time than I ought to. So once I find an image that works, I've started learning to just kind of pull it in. But here's the Mediterranean Sea, Red Sea, Egypt. This is Judah. So here's the Dead Sea right there. This is the Babylonian Empire in green right here over to the Persian Gulf. Again, here's the, the Median area and the Persian area. So what's in green was the kingdom of Babylon. So it's large. Um, it's large. So again, Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. What's said about the next kingdom in verse 39? Carl's already kind of pointed this out to us. Inferior. Inferior to yours. And so in 2.38, he's, Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as the head of gold. In th verse 37, he's referred to as the king of kings. And I think it's interesting to note that each successive kingdom is considered inferior. It's a metal that's of lesser value, but at the same time, it's a metal that's, a, that's stronger. They become stronger, and as you look at the history of each kingdom, they were each larger than the one before it. So from a human standpoint, we would look at these kingdoms and say, well, each one's better because they're bigger, they're more powerful, they're stronger. The metal has more strength to it. But from the perspective that we're told here in this vision, Nebuchadnezzar is considered the head of gold, and the other ones are considered inferior, even though they were bigger and had more military might. So I just think that's interesting. I have my own opinions about why that is, um, my own conclusion. I think it has to do with Nebuchadnezzar's growth and the, way, the things that he said did publicly. We'll look at that as we move along through the next few chapters. But Nebuchadnezzar is considered the head of gold. All right, second part of that statue chest and arms of silver. Who's that? Medo-Persian Empire, yeah. So the, uh, it, why is it called Medo-Persian? Anybody know? There was two of them, yeah. So the um, Medes, Medes were in power initially, and then Cyrus actually conquered. I've read of his grandfather, his uncle. There's some, some questions about some of the history there, but he was from Persia, and he conquered the Median portion, and so it was a combined nation, the Medes and the Persians, and we call it Medo-Persia. And um, we'll find out later that Cyrus had a habit of keeping a lot of the Medes in high positions. Um, so that, that's kind of how part of what he did to keep everything together, but it was the Medo-Persian Empire, so it was the Medes and Persians together. And again, here's the timeline that we looked at. So 539 was kind of the changing event. Um, and what Cyrus, Cyrus's general actually did, and we'll talk about it as we move a little further along, they dammed up the river that flowed into Babylon. They had, the city was actually built on the river, so it ran underneath. They made a diversion further upstream. And then on, it was a night in October. There's actually a date in history that's listed. I forget the date. I think it's October 11th, but I may be wrong about that. 539. They actually dammed it up, so it diverted all the water into that diverting canal that they had built, walked under the walls of the city, and, and conquered it. So uh, we'll talk about that more later, but that was in 539 that the Medo-Persian Empire just took over the Babylonian Empire, so one point in history there. And we see there were several kings listed here, Cambyses, Smyrtus. Smyrtus was actually considered an imposter king. He claimed to be the brother of Cambyses, and then apparently he wasn't actually the real brother of Cambyses, and so he was murdered. And, a year or less, and then Darius Xerxes, and there were several others after him. 
the history gets really confusing because there's some names that are overlapped and they have more than one name. So it gets really confusing when you read through it. But uh, there was Darius II after that, Artaxerxes, and I think he was the one when Esther, if I remember correctly, uh, and then Darius III. Um, it takes us up to the, and there were some other Artaxerxes in there too that, were, that are listed when you look at the history. And again, when we were looking at Babylon, it was kind of this area right through here, remember? Now we've got actually, a, during the Persian Empire, they take on this whole area, so it's massive compared to what Babylon was. And there's different, different, it's listed here, different kings, so it was at different sizes and different parts that were incorporated at different points in their history, but it was a big kingdom. So any questions, thoughts about that before we move on? Okay. Let's look at um, the belly and, and thighs of brass. Who's that? Greece, yeah. Yeah, so Alexander the Great was the first king of Greece, so it would be Greece. And 330 BC is when he uh, fought against the Medo Persian Empire and had a big victory there, so right here. So his father was Philip of Macedon, and then Alexander the Great um, was leading his army and conquered the Medo-Persians in 331. We'll talk more as we move into the next two chapters from now. Um, no, actually, it's, it's chapter 7, so it's a little bit later, but we'll talk more about him at that point in time. But he basically conquered the whole region, we'll look at the map in just a second, in just 10 years' time frame. It's just a massive, rapid conquest that he conquered everything. And then he died. And there was a little bit of time period where there was fighting, as, as there typically would be, because he didn't have a child to take the throne. And it was divided up among four of his generals and leaders at that point in time. And then um, eventually it kind of fell into two of them, the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic. So the Seleucids were the northern part, and the Ptolemies were e basically Egypt. Um, but this looks at the empire under Alexander the Great. So it's basically what the Medo-Persians had, a little bit more over here, and he went a little bit further over into India. But it was also a huge empire. And it, yeah, he went further in Egypt. Yeah, they had part of Egypt, but he actually went further over in Egypt as well. You've studied this before, haven't you? <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's impressive that he conquered all of that in just a 10-year time frame. It's amazing uh, when you read about the history of that. I'm not a historian, but it's really cool to read about. All right, back to question four, the uh, legs of iron with the feet of iron and clay. Who's that? Rome, yeah. That was Rome. And again, here's the uh, timeline, and you can look at yours if you want to see everything better, but there wasn't... With uh, Babylon and the Medo-Persians, there was a specific date. There was a big battle that really kind of concluded the power, even though it, there were several battles, but there was one deciding one with Alexander the Great. This was more of a kind of a transition from going from Greece into the, the Roman Empire that lasted over a time period of close to 100 years. Um, but eventually, um, I'm having trouble reading it on there, actually, because I'm so close to it, it's pixelated. So. Yeah, Pom Pompeii or Rome took over the Seleucid Empire in 64 AD, and they took over Egypt, which was the southern kingdom, the Ptolemaic, in 31. Um, and then Augustus was appointed by the Senate to be the first official Caesar in 27 BC, so that's kind of the transition into Rome. And you probably know the Roman Empire. It didn't go as far this way, but it wrapped the entire Mediterranean Sea. And so what is that going to give them control of? trade. They got, all, they got a lockdown on the trade, right? And so you don't really have to militarily control this area because you commercially control it. So they, they basically controlled the, the known world and all the trading, even the trading that would come in from the Far East at that point in time. So they were powerful from a commercial standpoint, and we all probably are fairly familiar with their military history too. They were very powerful from a military standpoint. And it's a good thing Jonathan Shilko's not here because I'd have to ask him some questions. He's a Roman ex history expert. Um, 
but the Roman Empire was impressive as well from a human standpoint. And again, I think it's interesting because when we look at what Rome accomplished, all the things that they did, how much of that still impacts us today, we would consider that possibly to be the greatest kingdom. But Nebuchadnezzar was told, you're the head of gold and every kingdom after you is inferior. So it's opposite the way that we would think about it. Um, there's lots of reasons maybe that we can conclude we're not really told why there's a lot of things that we could maybe put into that so again we're not told what any of these kingdoms are how do we know I mean how do you know I'm not just making all this up or just concluding what I want to how do we know that this is the, the right interpretation of what Nebuchadnezzar was told about why does it make sense Yeah. Yeah, and and we can look at history, right? We can we can look at the world history, and it it fits with all that. These these were the kingdoms when you look at history, that were powerful. And so after Babylon, it was the Medo Persians. You can look at history that outside the Bible, and it just it, it tells us that um, that there was one kingdom and another. And he's told there's going to be another kingdom, and then another kingdom, and another kingdom. And we look at history, and that's what happened. Um, also, we'll see in chapter 8, Daniel has another vision and names the next two kingdoms. So that, that helps us out, too, when he actually names them in that vision. It's not the same as this vision, but he actually says what those two kingdoms are and names them by name. Let me ask you this. Do you think there were other, world, other powers going on in the world if you go over to the Far East? Sure, sure there were other powers. So why, why are we talking about the world power here? And not, why, why does this vision not tell us about who's in power and in the Far East, or who's in power in the, the Far West and, and Europe? Pointing towards something. What's, where's, where's the whole history of the Bible focused in the future of, of our salvation? Yeah, right there. And so it, it all has to do with who's in control around this area, right? So the other part, things are going on in the world aren't important to this story. So that's part of that's why it's not included here. What's important to the, the Bible story is what's happening here in this promised land and the coming eventually of the Savior and where he was going to be crucified. So all that has to take place around this area right here. And that'll come into play later when we look at the last three chapters. It talks about the kingdom of the north and the king of the south. And those actually change, but it's all relative to right here. And so it, it helps us to remember that's, that's part of why it's talked about in this way. All right, back to um, question four, the very last one, the rock. Bart's already kind of answered that for us. Who's that? What kingdom? God's kingdom, yeah. And what is God's kingdom? The church, yeah. The church is his kingdom here, and it'll be his people in heaven uh, after this part of time for us, that it's the church. So let's, I, w I want to look at some, uh, oh, here's the timeline again, and Bart's already mentioned this, that the church was established during the Roman kingdom, so it all, that actually fits with all of the history as well. The church was established in roughly 33 AD. So let's, let's look at um, some scriptures that go along with that. Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Hebrews 12.28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Revelation 1.9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So I underlined in and kingdom because John was saying, I'm in the kingdom. He's, your, he's a brother in the kingdom. So the, the kingdom was established at this point. These are pointing towards the kingdom, which is the church, which was established. <coughs> so in, in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, when Daniel describes it, the stone crushed all four kingdoms. How can that be? I mean, if it came, if it came into being during the Roman Empire, how could it have crushed all four kingdoms? Because... Medo-Persian Empire, 
broke Babylon, Greece broke Medo-Persia, Rome broke Greece. How could the church break all four kingdoms when it was established during the Roman kingdom? Yeah, is it limited by any physical kingdom? What, what physical kingdom today contains the church? All of them. Yeah, it permeates all of them. That's why it became, it, it filled the whole earth in the vision, right? Because it permeates the whole earth. It doesn't matter what the physical kingdom is. So it has power over any physical kingdom. So that's why it's, just, it's pictured as crushing all of the world kingdoms because it, as far as power goes, it crushes them. They're, they're meaningless compared to the power of the church and the longevity of the church. There will be no, no country that can ever crush the church. It may look like it, just like it looked to Daniel and to his people, like they had been crushed, but ultimately God was still in control. And it's just it, it's the way it may look from an earthly perspective, but it's not, it's not what's really happening. God is ultimately in control. Um, but the church crushed the power of all earthly kingdoms and has filled the whole earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, clearly that was the under that was the thought process when Jesus came, right? You would think that they would know that, that Rome was that that church because they came in doing the iron Yeah, thank you. I meant to talk about that, so thank you for bringing that back up. So what let, let's let's explore that just briefly. Why does that picture Rome so well? Let me go back here. Why does that intermingling of iron and clay picture Rome so well? Iron is the strength, right? That's powerful. And he, Daniel specifically says iron, just like iron crushes everything else. But when you mix iron and clay, what is it? What does it do? How strong is it? It's not as strong. It's got the strength of the iron, he points out, but it's got the clay, which is fragile in it. How does that really picture the Roman kingdom? Ethan was kind of explaining it to us. You want to go further with that? Yeah, and we see that even um, when we read in the New Testament times, right? What was going on in, in Israel at that point in time? They were under Rome's control, right? They were part of the Roman Empire, but were they Roman citizens? Not unless they were born in a Roman colony. Paul was, right? But most people weren't. So they weren't really Roman citizens. Did they get benefits from being part of Rome? Absolutely. They got the commercial benefits. They got the government power that was there in control. But did they all like it? I mean, how did the Jews view Rome? And they weren't any different than a lot of the other countries. But as an oppressor, yeah, they were taken over by it. So they still got to kind of function somewhat independently, but not independently at the same time. And so th there were benefits there, but there were also a lot of drawbacks to it. And it created a, a strength, but yet a weakness at the same time in the Roman Empire. Wally? In that sense, yeah, that there's not unity, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the sense that there's not unity within it, yeah. And again, there's a lot of things that go into it, but thinking back, that may be part of why the picture of the Babylonian kingdom is one that fits more the model that God would have, where there is a leader that's looking out for the people and everybody follows. And I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar was a wicked man. I'm not saying he was good, but... Yes. And that's what God wants. Yeah, well, that's... Yeah, he was the earthly picture of that with a lot of wickedness, but God's picture of it is he's a, mon he's a, a loving monarch, right? He, he wants us to follow him absolutely, but he does, always does what's right and what's best. And so in that sense, it's a similar kind of kingdom, and everything since that is degraded. So we might look at our country and think it's the greatest thing that's ever existed. I'm not so sure God sees it that way because of the, the way that we tend to rule ourselves. He wants people that look to him, follow him, absolutely. Carl?
Yeah, so there's, there's a sense in which it conquered them all by conquering Rome, which had conquered the other ones. But, but I think that because it still is all four at once, the picture is that the church overpowers all kingdoms. So it's not just those four, right? It's the United States. It's the European countries. It's China. It's Japan. It's it, whatever country you want to pick. The church overpowers those nations. And so that's the message of that picture, that God's kingdom is the one that would overpower and grow and fill the earth. Right, throughout all ages, exactly. So look, looking at, we're we'll, we'll going to jump ahead here in just a second, but um, there's a premillennial viewpoint. The premillennialism is a false doctrine that seems minor on the surface. It's not. It undermines God in a lot of ways, so it's important to understand that it's a false doctrine. But they look at this vision and say the kingdom's yet to, to come, and it's not going to come until there's a ten-nation revival is what they refer to it. And they, they take part of that from Revelation, but part of it from here where there were the ten toes on the feet and it was mixed with iron and clay and until Rome is reestablished they say and then then Jesus will come back and establish his kingdom it'll be a powerful kingdom that fills the earth from more like a military standpoint so it's a false doctrine there's a lot that we could go into with that um, that we're not going to so let's that has to load each one there we go okay so let's go back to questions Part, question 2, part C, from, ch from chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, so that's back in Daniel's prayer after he's given the interpretation. Was God simply foretelling these future events, or would he be making them happen? Making them happen. So why did I ask you that? That's, a, that's an important distinction. Would it be powerful if God could tell Nebuchadnezzar 550 years in advance what was going to happen? Yeah, that's powerful. That's really powerful. But what's even more powerful? He made it happen. He said, it wasn't just, here's what's going to happen. I can tell the future. It was, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to get a little bitty glimpse later on in the book about how, what he's doing to make that happen. It's just kind of makes your head spin a little bit. But God's the one that causes that to happen. He says... Daniel, in, in, in understanding this, because he's been given the wisdom, he's been given the interpretation of the vision, Daniel says, he, God, changes the times and the seasons. That means he's the one that's changing who's in power. He removes kings and raises up kings. So Daniel's saying it's God that causes it to happen. He's not just telling the future. He's telling what he's going to do. And so, again, that should give us reassurance that no matter what happens, if everything looks like it's falling apart in the world around us, and it may be from a human standpoint, God is still in control. And all we, all we need to do is to follow him, put our faith and our allegiance in him, and we're going to be okay. It may be tough from a human standpoint, but he's in control. So there's a strong message here, just like it was for the Jews, a strong message for us. And just a reminder, with the Jews then, Daniel's in a high position now, right? He's kind of got the good life, but most of the Jews didn't. And so this would be, a, this would be an important message for them to have, that God's still in control, no matter what it looks like in the world around us. All right, applications on Wednesday night. Thanks, everybody.